COVID numbers are still rising on campus, but that didn't stop SU students from celebrating in large crowds after Sunday's March Madness game. And today, the SU community will be celebrating National Orange Day for the 151st anniversary of Syracuse University. Also, how sweet does this sound? SU men's basketball is heading back to the Sweet 16 for the third time in five years. All those stories coming up on Mornings on the Hill. Good morning, I'm Taharao. Thanks for joining us on Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Kathina Montgomery. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about in our first half hour. COVID cases are still a threat to campus life here at SU, but that did not stop many students from celebrating in large crowds after Sunday night's March Madness success. Our Sierra writer is live to tell us how the school and the co county are responding. Sierra? I'm live at South, outside Castle Court where the parking lot empty now, but on Sunday night, thousands of students flocked here after the Orange advanced to the Sweet 16. But what was missing was masks and distancing, making many wonder how the student is gonna res how this school is going to respond to the possible upset in COVID cases. But despite the threat, the school has not hinted at any consequences. In the following day of the mass celebrations, the Syracuse University Chancellor sending an email, not directly commenting on the celebrations, but instead stating, please remain vigilant, continue to follow the stay safe pledge and adhere to all public health guidance. Plus, when asked in a news conference about the Syracuse student gatherings, County Executive Ryan McMahon also less concerned with the celebrations and mass gatherings, but more so concerned with getting New York State to vaccinate students sooner rather than later. I'm not going to sit here and scold these kids um, in thinking that that's going to be the best solution. It's an easier solution to go vaccinate them than to get 10 to 15,000 kids during an NCAA Final Four run potentially to behave different than they normally behave. It, the easiest solution would be let me vaccinate them. 107 COVID cases on campus and we will continue to monitor these numbers and see if there is any effect from what happened here on Sunday night. Reporting live, I'm Sierra Ryder for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks, Sierra. Although cases are rising, which has caused the university to implement more COVID guidelines, they are optimistic about loosening up on regulations next semester. Sarah is hoping classrooms in the fall will look a little less like this and a little more like this. In an email, the chancellor announced that the university is planning for a fully in-person semester in the fall of 2021. SU gave a start date of Monday, August 30th. The university is hoping to bring normalcy back to the classroom and campus life while still reminding students to do their part and stay safe. This morning, we are learning more about those who, who lost their lives in the Boulder mass shooting on Monday. 10 people were killed and the suspected gunman is in custody. The victims range in age from 20 to 65. The Syracuse University community is sending their thoughts to a Newhouse alumna whose father was one of the victims. We are thinking of Erica Mahoney and her family during this time. Stimulus checks are rolling out for many people, including students. Mornings on the Hills, Caleb Britt spoke with a student who says the money has relieved stress. Good morning, guys. Along with the stimulus money being a stress reliever, the student also tells us how she plans to spend her $1,400. Ellie Huffman is a grad student who says she was excited to receive her $1,400 stimulus check. One day I just looked, my friends had a group chat and we're like, who got it? So, well excited. Huffman says the money is helpful as she completes her studies. She also says she plans to be responsible with the funds while treating herself a little. I will save most of it, but I'll probably treat myself to like a manicure, um, 
maybe some skincare stuff. Dr. Johanna Rogers leads social and economic equity initiatives to local businesses through an organization called Center State CEO and says the new stimulus check gives students the opportunity to save and invest for the future and pay off bills or debt. Paying down your credit card debt, you know, if you can take a portion of that and say, you know, what, I'm going to pay half of my car. That may not mean we can travel as far, but we can do like a weekend away. Like that's going to save you so much more in the long run. Dr. Rogers says this can also be an opportunity for students to be innovative and start a business. Whether you braid hair, sell dinners, make flyers, you know, you're tutoring, <laughs> you know, you could be a virtual assistant, like do something to economically engineer opportunities for yourself. Even if you spent some of your stimulus money on shopping or fun activities, Dr. Rogers says it's never too late to save or invest. Reporting from Syracuse, Caleb Britt, Mornings on the Hill. Earlier this week, the Student Association unanimously passed a bill that condemns anti-Semitism. The new resolution will call for more education and training of the student body related to anti-Semitism and Judaism. The new bill adopts the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. Syracuse students took the day to unwind and relax for their first wellness day. But what many didn't know is how close they were to having no breaks at all this semester. Our Rob Flack spoke with the Syracuse sophomore who started the movement for wellness. Syracuse University had its first of two wellness days on March 23rd and students took advantage of the break. And I've just been hanging out on the lawn, seeing some friends, enjoying the sunshine. Just put the headphones, listen to music, and tried to sleep on the grass. <laughs> it was awesome. Well, I'm spending my mental health day here with my significant other with a cute little picnic here on South Campus with some awesome Italian and Spanish meats. And students are saying that being outdoors and having the wellness day fall during such amazing weather is doing wonders for their mental health. I just think that this came at the perfect time since it's halfway through the semester and it's the point where everyone's kind of starting to like get, you know, feel the pressure of the year. So it's a really nice break from everything. The second day is planned on April 21st and Syracuse University could have easily had no breaks at all. And that was the original plan until other schools across the country began granting their students wellness days. And one Syracuse sophomore took notice and took action. Seeing that other people had started things and then looking at our calendar and these these other universities that are giving their students breaks, they also have, you know, days off here and there, and, and Syracuse just didn't have that at all. So and he credits the success of his petition to the strong social media presence at SU. He DM'd uh, the tab Syracuse, and they were actually nice enough to repost it. They have like 11 or 12,000 followers. So after they reposted that, there was a huge increase in, in signatures the petition but the focus should be on the campus community that came together to make sure the wellness days actually happen and he says he's so happy with the stories he's heard of people who were able to do things they just don't have time for during the regular schedule and he says he expects that to continue in the next one as well in Syracuse University hopefully he says can get some more but he says he doesn't really expect that to happen we just have the two for now Rob Flax mornings on the hill Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, Syracuse University celebrates the friendly, cheerful orange that walks around campus. Also coming up, see how SU students are basking in the sun as spring hits Syracuse. Stay with us for those stories and much more here no, on no, Mornings on sky. the Hill. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. After a couple of days of nice weather in central New York, the next following days are quite the opposite. Michael Cortez is live out on University Ave to tell us what to expect. Yeah, guys, not to rain on anybody's parade, but the weather took a complete 180 from yesterday's beautiful day. Being a little bit over a week away from April, it seems that the April showers might have come a little early. Looking at our Wednesday forecast, we are currently in the high 40s with some scattered showers. The rain seems to stay with us for most of the day. We should get into the high 50s later today. The rain should clear up in the evening with temperatures take a little dip. Moving on to the five day forecast, make sure to have your rain jackets handy in the next couple of days. 55% of chance of precipitation today with a high of 61 and a low of 51. 
The rain looks to clear up tomorrow and the weather looks to get a lot warmer even if we are having a cloudy day with a high of 76 and a low of 56. Then leading into Friday, the rain comes back on Friday where there is a 93% chance of precipitation. The rain should be clear this Saturday right in time for the Syracuse men's basketball Sweet 16 game. However, the rain comes back on Sunday. Now, like I said, if you have any errands to run this morning, make sure to grab a coat, maybe an umbrella, and go out there. Now back to you in the studio. Speaking of good weather, the first day of spring was this past weekend, and students here are excited about it. Our Natalie Fame spoke to some of those students around campus. No snow, blue skies, and students on the quad can only mean one thing. Spring has sprung. And while many students have seen springtime in Syracuse, underclassmen have not. One freshman says she has loved seeing the campus come to life. I like seeing everyone just walking around and everyone like kind of, I like how the campus is starting to feel more alive. Erickson Gomez agrees and says it's the first time he's felt like a true college student. Getting more of that actual college experience that we haven't gotten to actually feel much of so far. Now that it's warmer out, there are some things you can lose, like your winter coat. But no matter where you're going, you have to be sure to grab your mask. And of course, now you can also grab your favorite pair of sunglasses. I hope that COVID gets better as time goes on, so mm -hmm. hopefully we can start being a little bit more social. And the warm weather means an opportunity to make new friends. Just walking around and like meeting people that way, which is nice. Reporting on campus for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Natalie Fontley. Students are definitely celebrating the start of spring, especially with the Syracuse sun starting to come out. And today, Syracuse University students faculty and staff are celebrating Orange Day, which also happens to be Otto's birthday. Today marks the 151st anniversary of Syracuse University. To celebrate the university's founding in 1870, there are a series of campus and nationwide activities going on throughout the week also known as Forever Orange Week as well. Syracuse alumni clubs are planning a series of service projects while students can attend virtual activities such as career fairs and alumni engagement Zoom sessions. Still to come on Mornings on the Hill, our Matt Modinski talks about the men's basketball run to the Sweet 16. Stay with us and that story more just ahead. Good morning, I'm Matt Majinski with your Syracuse Sports Update. And oh how sweet it is, Jim Beheim and the Syracuse Orange are headed back to the Sweet 16. It's SU's third trip to the Sweet 16 in the past five tournaments and six since 2010. But with 15 other teams and 15 games before a national champion is crowned, there's still plenty of outcomes that can happen. So we're going to go through the Sweet 16 picks that I have. First starting off in the West region, Gonzaga and Creighton. Gonzaga the one first overall seed in the tournament have them moving forward. Creighton's going to be able to defend them a little bit, but the Zags are too much on offense. USC and Oregon, a Pac-12 matchup. No matter what, the Pac-12 will have one team in the Elite Eight. Oregon, the seventh seed, goes through. I like their perimeter a little bit more than USC. Then going down into the East bracket, Michigan and Florida State, all chalk through there to the Sweet 16. I've got Michigan going through into the Elite Eight. UCLA's been on a run, the 11 seed, but with Alabama, the two seed, going forward into the Elite Eight. We go over to the right side of the bracket where it's Baylor and Villanova. Villanova without Colin Gillespie for most of the tournament, but I've got Baylor going through. I think Villanova's run ends there. And then America's Cinderella team, Oral Roberts, it ends here. Arkansas moves on. Eric Musselman and them are going to be too much. Then going back down into the Midwest, the 8th seed Loyola Chicago and the 12th seed Oregon State. No one expected either of these teams to be here, but Loyola Chicago continues. Cameron Crutwig a little bit too much. Then Syracuse and Houston. I do have the orange in this one. Houston, 6'8 is their tallest player. That's not going to work against the 2-3 zone. Syracuse advances one more round. And Syracuse has gotten this far largely in part to their size in the 2-3 zone and hot shooting all around and especially the play of Buddy Beheim. But I spoke with two former Q stars, Dante Green and Chris Joseph, who explained why the 2-3 zone is so effective during March and if the Qs can keep it rolling to the Final Four. 
when you go and you're playing a team from other conferences who's never seen a zone before, seen a zone of that magnitude with those kind of rotations, because it's not a simple zone, right? It's not just protecting your zone. It's movement. There's uh, there's there's rotations for every pass that a uh, offense makes. To really beat the two three zone, you have to just shoot lights out, and you have to be on point, especially with teams that don't really play against the two three zone a lot. I suspect that guys like uh, Alan Griffin will have to step up a little bit and make some shots. You know, play some good basketball. Um, it's going to have to be really a collective effort because there's no secret now after two games what Buddy has been doing. The list of, you know, teams that has to, great players that just clicked at the right time, especially in March and, you know, have, have carried us through the, the tournament. And, you know, right now it's just, it's Buddy's time. It's run in San Antonio last night. And while the run is over for the Syracuse women's team, in the first round, the Cuse got an interesting draw against Summit League champs South Dakota State, and they were able to win 72-55. to but unfortunately, the NCAA likes making storylines in the bracket, and that's potentially why Syracuse was on the eight line instead of the seven to be able to get to that round of 32, a game against Connecticut. And it would be the final game for Tiana Mangakahio. The eighth seeded Orange were upended by UConn, 83 to 47. So while the season is over for Syracuse, the Huskies will go on for a Sweet 16 matchup against Iowa, which will put freshman Paige Beckers and Caitlin Clark against each other in a star-studded matchup. And number four Syracuse travels to Duke tomorrow to take on the number two Blue Devils in a primetime lacrosse matchup. Reporter Doug Cortez joins us with a preview. Doug, what do the Orange need to do to come out on top? Well, I don't want to know an ACC play this season, but to get past Duke, freshman Owen Hiltz has to stay hot. He's posted five or more points in each of the last four games, and he's really becoming a key part of the Orange offense. So look for that to continue in Thursday's matchup. And Doug, we know Duke has a potent offense. They've posted over 17 goals per game. What does Syracuse need to do to slow down the Duke attack? Well, slowing down the Duke attack means stopping Joe Robertson and Brennan O'Neill. They each have over 20 goals in this season. So look for Syracuse to double team them and find someone else that Duke has to come up with to beat the Orange. Well, thanks, Doug. And with a win tomorrow, Syracuse coach John Desco moves into 15th all time on the wins list. You can watch the game on the ACC Network. Faceoff is at 7. Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, Samantha Crosston has more on the controversy at the men's and women's NCAA tournament and how it unfolded over social media. Stay tuned. With us being in the month of March, our reporter Samantha Crosston has a story about how the NCAA did not match up when it comes to the men and women's basketball tournament. So for the NCAA Outrage has prevailed this week after a viral video on social media depicted the bare bones workout center for women's NCAA tournament players. This compared to the men who had an all encompassing facility at their disposal. Alyssa Cometti, a former Cuse lacrosse legend turned Orange Nation superfan, publicly voiced her dissatisfaction. You know, you're competing for a uh national championship and so when you're doing that you want access to the what you're used to and I can promise that a little weight weight tree and a yoga mat is not that. When the photos first hit the Twitter sphere the NCAA came out with a statement saying it wasn't money but rather space that limited them from installing a weight room for the women but Oregon forward Sedonia Prince released a TikTok that showed otherwise. Here's our practice court right and then here's that weight room and then here's all this extra space. If you aren't upset about this problem, then you're a part of it. After criticisms increased, the NCAA decided to act, sending a full weight room down to San Antonio. But to concerned fans who witnessed the NCAA's previous missteps, the move just seemed like they put a Band-Aid on a big mistake. And, you know, it's, it's not easy. I'm not saying they have an easy job, but just, you know, owning it a little bit more and saying we'll work, work to improve in the future is really just the key. As disappointed as Kometi and other women's basketball fans are, they also recognize that positive change comes from allowing the NCAA to right their wrongs. Calling out an injustice is huge, but also get in turn giving um, the NCAA uh, an opportunity to fix it and make it right to invoke change and to 18th and on March 19th her cries were heard. Dick Sporting Goods donated equipment for the women giving them a fully equipped weight room. 
And that'll be it for the for the show, folks. This is Taha Rao saying goodbye for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Kathina Montgomery. Make sure to catch our next show at 1030.